want to say a word. I appreciate Sean coming up and sharing at uh, the table with us this morning. Um, it's a blessing to see people do things generationally, don't you think? And when Sean was up here, I couldn't help but think about when his dad used to give communion meditations when you was up here. And he always gave excellent communion meditations to John. So you're following in his footsteps. And then you look forward to the next generation. So Colby. Oh, he just looked at me like a deer in the headlights. Colby and Isaac and even Brock are going to get their chance to come up here and share at the table. Uh, why did I ask? Well, I ask different men throughout the at different times, and some will say yes, and some will say no, but it uh, was an answer that came to me in prayer, and so we've got three new men uh, serving at the table this year. I had asked four, but not everybody wants to serve in this way, and I understand that. It can be out of way out of your desire to serve in this way, so I, I never take offense if somebody says no, but when somebody says yes, I'm very thankful, because I prayed about it, and those are some names I asked, so or that I got. So I'm going to share with you some scriptures this morning. Uh, Robert, this sounds a little too loud for me. Okay, thanks. Some scriptures this morning on a term that maybe isn't used all that much anymore. I don't hear this phrase used very much. It's kind of a biblical phrase, but I think it's important, especially where we're at today in society and where the church I think probably would be called to be if we were uh, hearing from prophets today like Jeremiah uh, spoke to the people. So I'd like you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 4. If you read through the prophets, and I encourage you to read through the prophets, not many people do, it can be work at times to read through the Old, Old Testament prophets because it just seems so gloom and doom, fire and brimstone all the time. And if you don't really understand the, the uh, context in which the prophets spoke, it can be a little bit overwhelming. There's a really good uh, Bible translation that you might want to read. It's called the Chronological Bible, where as you're reading through the historical books, the prophetic books are put within that context when they would have been spoken to which kings and which kingdoms. And that might benefit you as you read through, rather than to read the history books and then to read the prophets separately and try to remember how it fits or try to study how it fits, a uh, chronological Bible can probably help you in that. However, if, uh, if you read through the prophets, what you find very often is that sin has never changed. Just as God has never changed, so sin has never changed. The sins that people are committing today are the same sins they were committing thousands of years ago. And sometimes we think that, oh, everything's new. We're in a society with all these new technologies and new discoveries. That somehow things are different. Well, they're not. The hearts of men and women have always been corrupt, and their ways have always gone away from God. And when you read books like Jeremiah, you might say, Wow, that sounds an awful lot like today, which it does. If you read through Jeremiah, you might see some amazing parallels between uh, Judah, who he was speaking to, and America. And you might say, we need to take the words of Jeremiah to heart. And that's one reason why I want to share this with you this morning. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, Thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Circumcise, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your heart, O men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my wrath go forth like a fire and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. Well, what's this word fallow? If you're a farmer, you might know what fallow means. But me, I grew up in a city. I did not know what the word fallow meant. I, in fact, I never really heard of it, I don't think, until I read it in the Bible. And so when I looked it up, I found that uh, fallow land is both uncultivated land, or what we might call native land, but it's also land that has been used, but then has been left to sit. And certainly that is well known to those who uh, do farming, and even probably to the gardeners here that you just can't continue to plant in the same field over and over again 
without depleting the soil. And so it's an ancient practice that what the farmers would do until they got into the place where we've got the fertilizers and the amendments that we've got now, but what was very common for is pe people to have a field and to plant half of it and to leave the other half alone. And then the next year they would leave the planted side alone and then plant the other side so that the nutrients could replenish. And there's actually some nutrients that will come up from underneath. And of course, you'll get the decay of the, the uh, plant matter on top that can be tilled back in and be reused to replenish the soil. And so they were very used to this term, fallow ground, that it could mean uh, soil that has been untouched or soil that has been prepared at one time, but then has been left alone and maybe left alone for too long. Fallow ground is ground that's just been let sit too long. And so he says, the Lord says to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fallow ground and sow not among thorns. Well, is he giving agricultural advice? I don't think so. I think they probably had a pretty good idea of what they wanted to give man in and before the flood and that had been passed down. So people understood agriculture. But he's talking about break up the fallow ground of your heart. And you say, well, how do you know that? Because the very next uh, verse, the very next sentence says it. It says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts. So when things get broken up, when you have fallow ground that's broken up, you break it up. Today you'll see the farmers dragging a disker behind their, their tractor. But what they use is they've always used a tool called a harrow. And the harrow is an implement that might have spikes on it, might have some sharp tines on it, may even have standing discs on it, something that is very violent to the soil to bring about preparation for the new crop to get rid of the clumps of, of plant matter and to break up the dirt clods and to make it prepared for the soil. And that's where we get that word harrow in our language. When we talk about something being a very difficult situation, we say, Wow, I went through a harrowing ordeal. You get it from that idea, that harrow. There's something that's very, very difficult to go through, and yet it brings about a positive result. And so he's saying, get yourself ready and get your heart ready for what the Lord has to say to you. And he says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskin of your hearts. Now, circumcision is something that was done for the Jews clear back to Abraham. It was their outward sign of the, the covenant that God had made with Abram that his descendants would be his people and that he would bring the Messiah through there. And there was an outward sign that had taken place. And every male child that was born, they would have a circumcision ceremony on the eighth day. And we read about Jesus being circumcised on the eighth day at the temple when he was taken there. It was an important part of their religious um, tradition and their identity to have the circumcision ceremony take place so everybody in the community knew that, yes, this new male child has been brought into the nation. And if people wanted to join uh, with the Jews later on and they would become a proselyte to the Jewish religion, well, they would need to be circumcised. And they had public baths, and so the men would go to the public baths, and when they were there, everybody would know by circumcision whether or not that person was a follower of Jehovah. And so it was a very public ceremony, and it was evident to everybody that it had been done. Well, it's no different than a circumcision of the heart. Now, you can't open up your chest cavity, of course, and cut off the excess flesh around your heart. That's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is preparing your heart by getting rid of the sin that's in your heart. You see, the foreskin was illustrative of sin and of worldliness, and so same thing, sin in our heart that we keep in our heart identifies us with the world rather than identifying us with God. And that's why Jeremiah says it like he does. He's saying, get the ground of your heart ready so that you might bring about some crop for the Lord in your, in your life. Otherwise, look what he says. He says, otherwise my wrath will go forth like a fire 
and burn with none to quench it because of your evil deeds. Evil deed being that they've not gotten their heart ready for the Lord. Well, this same phrase is used again in a more extended way in Hosea. So if you want to turn over to Hosea, another Old Testament book, another prophet. Hosea had an interesting ministry. Hosea was preaching to the idolaters. Hosea chapter 10. And so the Lord wanted him to really understand how he felt by having his people go astray into idolatry and how for God it was no different than having an unfaithful wife. And so he commanded Hosea to marry a prostitute. And she actually had three children by three different men. And he wasn't allowed to divorce her. And so his life was a living metaphor, you might say, for God and Israel and their wantonness by having abandoned God. And so Hosea has a very insightful ministry. And listen to what he says here in Hosea 10, 9 through 14. From the days of Gibeah you have sinned, O Israel. There they have continued. Shall not the war against the unjust overtake them in Gibeah? When I please, I will discipline them, and nations shall be gathered against them that they are bound up for their double iniquity. Ephraim was a trained calf that loved to thresh, and I spared her fair neck, but I will put Ephraim to the yoke. Judah must plow. Jacob must harrow for himself. Sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap steadfast love. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. You have plowed iniquity and you have reaped injustice. You have eaten of the fruit of lies. Because you have trusted in your own way and in the multitude of your warriors, therefore the tumult of war shall arise among your people and all your fortresses will be destroyed. Oh, some great pictures in there, isn't there? So they've turned away from God. They not only turned away and trusted in the strength of other nations, but they've also gathered the gods of other nations and they're worshiping them. They no longer trust in the Lord. And so he's saying, look, it is time for you to plant a new field. You need to get rid of this injustice that's going on. And he says, because you've trusted in other nations, I will have other nations overtake you to discipline. It's that old, you reap what you sow thing, right? That's exactly what's going on here. And he's saying, if you sow for yourself, verse 10, righteousness, then you'll reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground. This is a very difficult thing to do, to break up the fallow ground of the heart. And you might say to me, well, Bill, we're, we're Christians. We've broken up the fallow soil of our heart, and we do. In fact, that's what repentance is. Repentance, when we come to Christ, is breaking up the hardness of our heart and allowing the word of God to penetrate us and to change us. And when we repent, then the spirit of God comes into our life and we're able to bear good fruit for him. And he's saying that's exactly what you can do. However, what I find in my heart, maybe you found it in your heart, unless you're, well, you're probably all better than me. But this is what I found in my heart is that even though I've broken up my heart to receive the Lord, I always have some area of my heart that I've hardened. Is that just me? That there's some area of my heart that I've decided I was just going to keep for myself, some fallow ground. And it's only when I read the Word of God and I spend time in prayer and I really seek Him that the Lord reveals to me where the fallow ground in my heart is. And He says, Bill, you've been keeping apart from me been keeping something away from me. I wonder if he does that for you too. And he tells you in your heart where you once had greed, I want you to break that up so that you can have contentment. Does he say to you where, where you once had lust, I want you to have satisfaction. Does he say where you once had hatred, I want you to have love. Does he say to you, where we once had bitterness, now I want you to have peaceableness? Does he say to you, where you were once impatient and frantic and running around and expecting everybody to meet your needs, I want you to finally settle down and have patience 
and peace. You see, we've all got something in our heart that we want to keep for ourselves. And we say, Lord, you can have my life, you can have my heart, but there's this one little part, Lord, that I just want to nurse for a while. I want it to be mine. And God says, that's not the way it works. If you come to me, it's all or nothing. I want you to break up your fallow ground. Listen to what he says here about Ephraim. He says, Ephraim was a trained calf that loved to thresh, and I spared her fair neck. But Ephraim I will put to the yoke. Now that's really something. In it. They would take these young oxen, these calves, and they, they weren't quite ready for the difficulty of the plow. The plow is a very difficult implement. The plow is something that the animal has to wear a heavy yoke, perhaps be joined to another animal. They have to drag behind them an iron plow. They, have, they are under the direction of the plowman. And it's a sweaty, difficult, day-long job. And so you don't give that to a calf. To the calf, they would take the calf up to the threshing floor. And the threshing floor was where all of the wheat had been gathered together. And you've seen that, haven't you, in illustrations and perhaps in pictures. They still do it this way around the world, where the reapers will go out with their long sickles and they will mow down the wheat and they will gather it in great big shocks and they will carry it up to a threshing floor and they will lay it all out where the heads can be broken apart from the chaff. And you take a young calf, who's not terribly heavy, you know, like an oxen, and you let them walk over that grain to break it up. And it's a fairly easy job for the animal, but it can be difficult because they're walking over the grain that they want to eat. <laughs> and so there's a law that had been given to the, to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 25, and it is this, don't muzzle the ox while it treads the corn. In other words, don't make the thing long for what it is working under without having to reap its benefit. And so what they would do is they would put a feed bag on the calf and the calf would do the easy work. So easy that it could eat while it was working. But God said, you've been doing that. You've been doing it for so long and for so and it's been so easy for you that you've taken my love and my grace for granted. See? And that's an easy thing for churchmen to do, isn't it? We can walk around on the threshing floor all day long and just be within our own community and never have to do anything terribly difficult. And it's a very leisurely pace. Oh, you can live your life and just be continually surrounded by Christians not having any real opposition to you. Um, not having any accountability. Nobody's holding you accountable for the life that you live because everybody's got it fairly easy. In fact, this very same phrase is used in the New Testament for preachers. Isn't that something? Don't muzzle the ox while they tread the grain. In other words, pay your preacher while he's doing ministry work. It's a fairly easy job. <laughs> and let him earn his keep from that is what the Lord's saying. Don't make it feel as though he's got to go out and do something extra in order to earn a wage. So it's, you know, take care of that soft, comfortable man. There's a lot of soft, comfortable men in pulpits today. So I need something like this. When I open up my scripture and I read it, I need this. Okay, maybe you've been too long on the threshing floor, and maybe it's time to get out to the difficult work of the clown. So he says, Ephraim had a series. It's time for you to get out and do some difficult work. And the difficult work is getting rid of your idols and getting rid of your foreign allegiances and just accepting everything that the world tells you that it's all right and God will wink an eye at sin. And it's not the way it is. And it's not at all the way it is. He says, the tumult of war will rise among your people and all your fortresses will be destroyed. And friends, I'm afraid that in America today, the fortresses of comfort and respectability 
that the church has long enjoyed are starting to be torn down uh, by people in the world that hate God and hate his church. And it's time for the church to do the hard work of contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Ecclesiastes 11.6 says, In the morning sow your seed, and at evening withhold not your hand. For you do not know which will prosper, this or that, whether both alike will be good. He's getting at the same idea. Get yourself ready for the Lord in the morning and have your heart ready. Do the threshing in the, or the uh, do the harrowing in the morning. Get yourself ready and sow that seed of God's word in the morning. And then the evening, let it come out as fruit. Withhold not your hand. You never know when somebody's going to be in need and you can meet that need. And sometimes it's a physical need. I had a man come by my house one time and he was cold and it was... Uh, very, very cold outside and snowing, and he asked, can I have a coat? And then he came back another time and asked, can I have some food? And those are very easy things for us to do at our house. We got ample clothing and more than enough food, and so that's a very easy thing to give out. But what about when somebody calls you in difficulty and says, I've got somebody here who has zero direction in their life, they don't know what to do. They're on the very urge of despondency. And I called you because you're a Christian and you have hope. That's when the plowing begins. That's when the difficulty begins. And you can't do that work unless you've been properly trained for it. And that's why God tells Israel and Judah and America to break up your fallow ground. Don't harbor those things. Can you imagine going over to somebody and talking to them about the peace that, brought, that Christ brought you in your life, and yet they say, well, I see you at work every day, and you're anything but peaceable. You're going to talk about peace. I want to talk to you about the love of Christ and how his sacrifice was for the whole world and how he gave himself for me and how it changed me. And people say, you're a Christian? I would have never guessed that. That's why we have to do this, friends. The getting ready our hearts and breaking up the hollow ground has to happen in the morning because we don't know what's going to happen in the evening. But here's the truth of it. The Lord rewards those who follow him and do good to others by bringing about good things in your life. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. I know you're all familiar with this. This is so, uh, so well known that you can probably say it without me even reading it. You just know it so well. But here Jesus is talking about the hard ground that needs harrowed and the results of those who have done that. In Matthew 13, beginning in verse 1, it says, The same day Jesus went out of the house and sat down beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat down. And the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. So there's the fallow ground. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since it had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. And other seeds fell among thorns, and thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundred fold, some sixty and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And then the disciples come to him and say, can you explain that parable to us? And he says, it's the easiest one. And so he explains it to him in verse 18. Hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's been sown in his heart. And this is what was sown along the path. Again, the fallow ground. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches come and choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. 
Well, how does he understand it? He's broken up his fellow ground, right? How does he understand it? He heeded the words of God to him. He prepared himself. Just like John the Baptist, when he came, he said, prepare the way of the Lord. And the preacher says the same thing today to the church in America. Prepare the way of the Lord. Get your hearts ready. Bring down the high places. Bring up the low places. Throw the rocks out of your lives. Pull the weeds. Bring it in a nice, straight, even path so that when the Lord sows his word among you, listen to this, but those who hear it says on good soil, they will indeed yield in one case a hundredfold and in another 60 and in another 30. How are you doing? How are you doing? How's your harvest? How's your harvest? You might be honest and say, Bill, I, I'm not ready for a harvest. Uh, the seed that is sat there is just sitting there and the devil's snatching it away every day. Well, break up that fallow ground. Break it up. You can do it. What it takes is humility. And it takes a heart willing to say, Lord, I'm done trying to do it my own way. I'm ready to do it your way. Lord, I'm sick of following the crowd and I just want to follow the one who gave himself for me. Lord, I'm at the very end of myself and I can't go any farther and I'm ready, Lord, for some direction and I need you to direct me. Lord, I've held this one part of my heart away from you for so long. It's been too easy to nurse my grudge. It's been too easy to be greedy for the things around me. It's been too easy to covet all the things that my neighbor has. It's been too easy to live in doubt and to act like I believe it, but yet I really don't believe it. It's been too easy to do that, to turn to him and say, Lord, I'm preparing my heart today by getting on my knees and saying, Lord, I am completely yours. And if you don't think that's difficult, you've never been under the harrow of God's spirit. And if you're under the harrow of God's spirit today, friends, let it do your work. Let it do the work. For so many years, I knew a hard-headed young man who said, oh, I'm not a sinner. I've never done anything terrible until he heard a gospel message. And the Holy Spirit came upon his life just like a disker behind a tractor and he tore up all the excuses and all the reasons why he wouldn't do it and all the pride in his heart. And finally, he was completely broken and the word of the Lord came in and completely transformed his life. He can do that for you today. If you're hiding some little area of your life and you're saying, oh, Lord, I don't want you to touch that. I'll deal with it on my own. Let the Holy Spirit convict you of that. You say, well, I don't know what it is. Yes, you know what it is. Don't tell me you don't. It's that thing that bothers you at night. It's that thing that your conscience will not let you be. That's the thing. And if you don't know where your faults lie, ask your wife. or your husband, or anybody around you. Because I am certain that all my friends that are close to me know where my faults lie. And if I were brave enough to ask them, they would say, Bill, that's your fellow now. And maybe that's what we ought to do. To say, Lord, I'm ready to bear fruit for you. I'm ready to really have a life change for you. I'm tired of hiding this one section of my field from you. And Lord, show me who I can ask that will be honest enough with me, straightforward enough and loving enough that I can do it with their help. Because the ox doesn't do it all by himself. The ox has a plowman. And the Lord is our plowman. And sometimes he sends those friends or relatives, those co-workers, those fellow students along beside us to say, I know it's difficult, but let's keep the harrow in until it breaks up. All that mess is ready for the truth. Paul writes this to the church in Galatia. He says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh, from the flesh he will reap corruption. To the one who sows the Spirit, the Spirit will reap. Let us not be deceived. 
not know Mary is doing good for a new season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we had an opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. So I ask you, is your heart ready for the seed of the word? Have you broken up the clods, taken out the stones and weeds? God says through Ezekiel, I will make them and the places all around my hill a blessing, and I will send down the showers in your season, and they shall be showers of blessing. Father God, we pray for the